Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Nina Ha, and I'm the director of the Asian Cultural Engagement Center. Before this event gets started, I would like to say the land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge the Tudalo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the, to the Tudalo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge the, the university's historical ties to the indentured and enslaved whose labors built this institution. We pay respect to these people for their contributions to Virginia Tech. Um, once again, um, welcome to the Inspiration Series. The title of this panel is Illuminating a PhD Graduate Student Research Experiences. Um, I wanted to first begin by acknowledging um, what happened last week and how it's affected the APIDA community. And um, one way to consider this acknowledgement um, is actually the response is, I want to celebrate um, the APIDA students, especially the graduate students who will be actually um, presenting here today um, to all of you. And I want to let you know the, how proud I am of Zhuan, Annie, and Hannah, whom I know personally and really well, and I'm so proud of them and proud of their courage for speaking and for being here. Um, to share their research, their knowledge, who they are with all of you, um, especially during this moment. Um, it is a moment for us, rather than to focus on tragedy, to celebrate um, our community and showcase how strong we are as a community and to share that with all of you. Um, so I would like to begin by actually um, just going over the students' names, the, uh, the title of their project, or their, their work that they'll be presenting today, and a short biography of theirs. And we'll be going in order of um, who will be presenting first, second, and third. Um, so the first is Jung Won Kim, who is um, the Asian Cultural Engagement Center's pro graduate programming assistant, and also a sociology PhD candidate, um, fifth year. And the title of his work is, quote, more than jo just K-pop, the racialization of cultural toolkit and the making of contemporary Korean diaspora. Um, Jung Won Kim received his BA in sociology from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and master's in sociology from DePaul University with distinction. Jung Won is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at Virginia Tech. He is also, um, as I mentioned before, he's part of the ACE Center um, and a graduate research associate for the Lab Laboratory for the Study of Youth Inequality and Justice. His current research examines racialization, whiteness, and language use, particularly in the transnational context between the US and South Korea. Next will be Annie Y. Patrick, who is um, a fifth year doctoral student in the Department of Science, Technology and Society or STS. And the title of her presentation is Engaging with the Invisible, STS Groundwork in an Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Annie Y. Patrick is a fifth year, oh, did I say this already? I think I did, right? I am sorry. Um, and then finally, um, Hannah Chan, who is a graduate research assistant and third year PhD biomedical engineering and mechanics. Um, her presentation is advances in automotive safe safety research, improving occupant protection for small females. Um, Hannah received her BSc in Biomedical Engineering Biomechanics from Case Western Reserve University. She's currently a doctoral student in Biomedical Engineering at Virginia Tech, Wake Forest University School of Biomedical Engineering and Sciences. Her research is focused on automotive occupant safety and crash injury biomechanics. Hannah was previously a Virginia Tech graduate student diversity scholar and is currently the graduate student liaison for the Asian American Student Union, a co-chair of the 
Asian Pacific Islander Desi American Caucus and serves as our department's diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion committee. So as you can see, they are amazing, amazing students, and I can't wait to hear, hear their work. Um, so let us begin. Um, Jungwon? Okay, thank you all so much for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen now. Um, I don't think I'm gonna do uh, an introduction, but it is. It, I do see some happy birthdays in the chat. Thank you so much. I am very happy to be spending my birthday actually doing this. Usually this, um, actually I spent the last, I think a lot of my birthdays presenting just cause it's conference season in March and spring. And I love doing this. So I'm so happy that everyone's here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nina Ha and uh, the Asian Cultural Engagement Center for providing me. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Anyways, um, <laughs> okay, so the I'm, I shortened the title um, in, in, in just communicating sort of what I'm trying to do in this paper. Um, and given that everything that has happened, I, I actually took the route of trying to illustrate a puzzle for you, sort of a, a theoretical framework without jargons as much as possible and something that is communicated vis-a-vis -vis, um, meaning uh, and art. Uh, so it's gonna be a little bit less empirical. So the title of my presentation is The Racialization of a Cultural Toolkit and the Making of Contemporary Korean Diaspora. And let's actually jump to who I am. Uh, because I'm more than what I was just described, right? And that we all are uh, in that, you know, I'm, okay, first I'm a sociologist um, of race and ethnicity. Uh, you know, I'm an ethnographer. That means that I, you know, I conduct interviews. I do participant observation. Um, that's how I find stuff out. Um, that's how I, but I'm also a scholar activist in that uh, I don't just produce scholarship for the sake of scholarship. And if it is, it's it's to really contribute to the body of scholarship that is on race and racism. And it's important because I'm trying to raise awareness on racial justice in just about every scholarly endeavors that I involve myself in. <clears throat> so I see these processes as mutually uh, constitutive. And I want to sort of acknowledge my position in this. And before I move on and to that, that I'm still decolonizing myself. Um, this is a sort of an everyday practice. As Stuart Hall calls it, identity is a ever going process, right? It's not a, an accomplished thing. It's not just it's always changing. So I'm indebted to the knowledge of uh, and the scholarship really of black women, particularly the work of Patricia O'Collins. So goodness gracious, why is this not going? Okay, so my positionality. So what does this all mean? Let me just go ahead and move this down. Well, um, critical self-examination of myself is really the imperative to my own racial biography and identity. And it, the context of my research is sort of set by that. And I start with this assumption and I'm honest about it. And I, I'm a 1.5 generation Korean, Korean American, right? But my nationality was a Korean, but then I immigrated here and so forth. And the complexities of these two identities, like I'm not, I'm not, you know, not fantastic at uh, Korean, but I'm proficient enough that I can communicate fluently. I can't write at the proficiency I am in English, but I can read. There's all these juxtaposition of identity and identification and how I'm situated in between that and how I can convey this this, if, if you will, a position of marginality, according to Patricia Collins, what she calls the outsider within this status. And anthropologists, uh, anthropologists have, uh, I mean, straddled on this notion many, 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 through many, many different bodies of scholarship, but really I want to really focus on my racial identity and how that and my and the privileges that I do have, but within those privileges, the marginalization that shape my, if you will, my double consciousness. And this is a gift and a curse, according to W.B. Du Bois. This is the second sight, allows me to observe a particular racial situation where it wouldn't be available otherwise. Um, so with that recognition, I want to move on. Um, to the study. Okay, so what is Hallyu, you might ask? 
that is the topic of the conversation today. Excuse me. Well, Hallyu is basically, I mean, that's a, what it means is Korean cultural way, the K-pop, K-drama and so forth. And so let me do a brief, cause I know not everyone's into uh, BTS who I'll be discussing a little bit today, but uh, it is a Korean cultural wave. Um, the scholars have talked about how this is in the second paradigm uh, because it's globalized, it's cons Korean popular culture consumed outside of the, uh, the if you will, Korea, um, for, for example, the United States and so forth. So what this allows me to do is one of my scholarly endeavors is that the, uh, I try to enter into a discussion of culture to talk about racial matters. But these discussions have been sparse and disjointed. And so I want to bridge this to understand how racial and ethnic minorities overcome the whiteness of culture. So really, according to cultural sociologist Ann Squidler, uh, this is a demystification of the use of culture. This not, culture is not just a hoity-toity thing that everyone has. This is not just all high culture. People use culture as a pragmatic way to navigate around life. For example, Swidler cites this uh, timid engineer who gets divorced and learns salsa dancing. Um, to you know, enter the date, re-enter the dating scene. So, you know, my research agenda has been, you know, looking at how does race play out in a cultural setting. So, previous research that I've done really focused on racial situations in the context of leisure, um, live concerts, for example, uh, predominantly white spaces, also focused on intra-ethnic othering. But my current plan is how can I make sense of cultural practices as uh, what Swidler calls strategies of action. It just makes sense. We have a culture as a toolkit. It's within a repertoire. We have to just put that into context with racial matters. So uh, it does not take a sociologist, hopefully, to understand that people do things that are cultural for a reason. There are survival practices. I, I claim that they are uh, defiance against the white dominant culture. And there are improvisation within structural constraints. So I want to demonstrate that for you through this three minute video of uh, this Japanese artist, guitarist uh, playing, if you will, uh, over uh, BTS, um, Dynamite. Uh, give me one second while I share that. Share the screen, share sound. Cause I, I, I ain't the stars tonight So watch me bring the fire and set the night light My shoes on, I get up in the morning, cup of milk, let's rock and roll Kink out, kick the drum, rolling on like a rolling stone Sing song when I'm walking home, jump up to the top of the brown Ding dong, call me on my phone, nice tea and I'll get my ping pong <laughs>
Okay, so let me just go ahead and reshare my PPT screen. Give me one second. Okay, so that was um, a performance by uh, Yumi Corino, uh performing a rock instrument, right? Guitar, and I don't want to want to the whole notion that rock is very constructed around this notion of masculinity. And um, but right, there's a lot of things that play here. Covering a BTS song, which is a very popular K-pop group, the level of practice. You know, it wasn't just any cover. You can see that there was a quite a bit of a virtuosity. Actually, there was a lot that was pretty damn good, if you ask me. And uh, you know, how does this break, or you know, the, the the you know stereotypically reified racial and gender stereotypes? You know, how does this subvert that regime of meaning? So, with that being said, thank you so much. And you know, I am just trying to understand from the ground up again. Now, um, that's where I'm at with this. So I appreciate it. If you have any questions, and uh, you know, these, uh, if you could stay within the parameters within these topics for suggestions, that'd be great. So I just want to first say thank you all for being here once again, and I uh, thank you for uh, and uh, you know letting me sort of uh, convey this puzzle to you all. Thank you so much. Uh, so any questions or is this in the chat? I think it's, uh, we have uh, five minutes for Q and A, right? Jung Wan, um, could you maybe stop screen share? Yes. Thank you. Um, I was thinking if people don't have anything in the chat, hopefully we can have a discussion among all three of you at the end, for sure. Will that work? Oh, okay, okay. Okay. That works too. Okay, thank you. And feel free to put anything, any questions in the chat while you're listening to uh, the three presenters. Um, Annie, you're up. Can everybody see my screen? Great, thank you. Um, so first, just thank you to everybody for coming out and um, taking time to listen to us today. Thank you to Dr. Ha for giving me this opportunity. Um, so the title of my presentation is Engaging My Own Invisibility Visibility. And in this presentation, I will discuss uh, my research projects and I will also share to how they connect to myself and the APETA community. So first up, just a little bit of background on my research. Um, so I currently work as a um, GRA, a graduate research assistant on a grant with the Bradley Department of Computer and Electrical and Computer Engineering on a NSF funded grant that is called Revolutionizing Engineering Departments or just RED for short. And this grant was first initiated in 2015 by Dr. Don O'Reilly, who at the time was really challenge challenging and incentivizing universities across the nation to really rethink about how they were teaching engineering, how they were constructing um, future engineers, and therefore also giving us a better idea of like how are we looking at the engineering culture and what do we want it to be? And as we can see from this quote, Dr. Riley wanted people to either go bold, go bold with their ideas or basically just go home. 
one of the um, caveats of this particular grant was that it had to include a social scientist to be part of it. One of the principal investigators had to be a social scientist. So for the, um, the grant here at Virginia Tech with the EC department, that particular um, social scientist happened to be Dr. Matthew Wisnowski, who is a historian of innovation technology within the STS department. Around that time that the EC department was awarded this grant, I came to the STS department um, as a first year graduate student and I was asked to be on this particular grant in this project and I readily accept it. So one of the first tasks that I had as a GRA with this grant was doing this large scale data collection. And it was a qualitative study of where I did um, about over 50 in-depth interviews with all the major stakeholders within the department. And that included faculty members, undergraduate students, um, the um, advisors, the um, alumni and the industry board members. And I took all this data and I transcribed it, I coded and I analyzed it. And then after I analyzed this data and got most of the major themes out of this data, I took it and I shared it with the red team. And one of the first things that we discussed was the fact of what does it mean to be an engineer? And what does it mean to be an electrical and computer engineer? And what does it mean to, what does it take to become one? And of course, one of the first things I learned about becoming an engineer is that there's a lot of math, physics and logic involved. And then I also learned, I'm um, very interested that engineering by engineers is considered to be a creative process too. Um, at the same time, I was learning about what it meant to be an engineer. And the things that I found interesting there is that one particular industry board member commented and said to me that it made him who he was today. And that really showed up in how people, when they studied engineering, they also became this engineer. Um, and then also there was this idea of like within ECE at Virginia Tech that it's actually um, commented that it was one of the most feared engineering majors at um, the university, but that was also something that was said and shared with pride. So of course I shared this with the department and for some of people, a lot of people on the team, no surprise did they kind of knew that. And so that was the first part of the data that I shared with people. But then there was a second part of the data that I shared with the team. And that had to really go into the barriers and the challenges within the EC department. And one of the things that came up uh, was this communication of how do we get people to talk more to each other? How do we get people out of their silos? And this is one quote uh, from one of the participants that kind of bridges and shares into that. Um, another thing was just the lines of divisions among labor at times. And that was another thing that came up. And then, of course, last but not least, um, a conversation that I asked was about diversity. Uh, and I wanted to really understand people's perspective of diversity within the field of engineering, within Virginia Tech, and also just within the department. And uh, on the comments that I um, received was like that, of course, if you're African American or you're Hispanic, that you may feel lonely. And then there's also this lack of diversity. So I shared these things with the department too, and they were well received. Um, but then like with a lot of large scale complex um, initiatives, sometimes things get a little bit juggled around. And this kind of moved toward the, the background of what was going on. Um, and with that much being said, um, I was at a place where I had this data, I analyzed it, and I saw the challenges, and I saw that was what was going on. And I really, really, really wanted to do something. Because not only did I care about this data, I really cared about the people that I interviewed, I cared about their stories, and I just wanted to do something, but I wasn't always exactly sure how to do it or what to do it. Um, and what was interesting is around the time that I was completing the analysis of this data, I took this really interesting class. And this class was called Engaged STS um, with Dr. Downey. And one of the great things about this class is that it showed me that how I could be a social scientist but how I could be a social scientist that was also engaged with the community that I was studying. And this class really helped me to have the tools to do those different things. And I remember reading this particular quote from the book, Cyborgs and Citadels, and it really just giving me this idea that, okay, I can do something and that it's a good thing to do something. And when we talk about taking on the scholar participant role and becoming an engaged scholar, we think about the tools such as critical participation, action research and experimentation, just to name a few of those things. So with that, I then had the tools and a way to return back to the community that I had just studied and to really address the challenges that um, I had gathered from my study. But then the question also became, okay, I'm gonna go back and study this and help this community, but what exactly am I helping to do? And with some help with my advisor and my committee and my team, it really became down to this thing that I was really looking at was invisibility. And when you have 
invisibility, then you have to have this other notion of visibility. And I realized that what I wanted to do and what I wanted my participation to be was to create visibility in invisible spaces, to make invisible people, ideas, and images visible. Because one thing that I learned um, from this data that was really interesting to me is that people said that the images of um, that were currently within engineering were the things that were sometimes the barriers to um, making engineering more diverse. But people also believe that shifting the image could also be the solution to bringing diversity to engineering and the community. And I realized that that was going to be about bringing visibility to the images that are not always dominant, that we don't always see, and especially shifting and challenging the accepted images that we have of who can be an engineer and also what engineers do. And this was a particularly interesting quote from one of the participants that I studied in that 50 participant interview um, study. So knowing all of these different things, having the theory from STS, having the pragmatic knowledge, the next step was of course, well, let's, let's do some stuff. And so for me, I am currently doing three things that are part of my dissertation. Um, and these three projects all work to address some area of invisibility within the department. And so the first thing is a podcast, and this is a limited series podcast, and it's called Engineering Visibility. And yes, you can actually find it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, and the whole idea of Engineering Visibility is being this platform of voices for people and topics and concerns that you just may not readily associate with engineering or with the EC department. One interesting um, um, episode I did was with a non-traditional um, engineering student, which was students who returned to pursue an engineering career um, after they had another career or like late into their 20s. Um, I just released the women in engineering, um, women in electrical computer engineering episode um, a few weeks ago. And that was a great episode because it allowed this opportunity um, for women to share what is it like to one, be a student in the classroom in this male dominated field. And then also what is it like to work in this field? And I truly believe that if we take people's stories and we push them out, that they get heard and they do slowly make a shift. Um, the next project that I'm working on is a non-traditional career seminar. This actually happens this Thursday, um, so please attend if you want to. Um, and the idea behind this is that the research for the department revealed that a lot of the graduates either went into the defense sector or they went into the tech industry. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with those areas. But the other thing that I was learning is that students really like what they were learning but they, some of them wanted more options. And so I've um, had these four alumni who have um, pursued um, completely non-traditional careers with their EC degree, and they're gonna speak on Thursday and share their career path and journey with everybody. And the idea behind this is one, re taking a different turn on what is success, how we identify success, and challenging the visible notion of what we always think of success as being and saying, hey, success is more than just one or two things. It can be a lot of different things and bringing visibility to that. Um, last but not least, I am developing a white paper. And this is to highlight the emotional labor, the um, intimate labor and the visible work of the academic career advisors. Because what I learned through my interviews is that the academic career advisor um, were very much tightly um, involved in the success of the student, but in different ways that I didn't hear in the conversation conversation with faculty, where faculty may really talk a lot about the classwork and labs and different things like that. I was hearing more of like the mental health and these other needs from the advisors. But one thing I recognize is that there was um, seemed to be a disconnect between the faculty members understanding what the advisors do and how it contributes overall. Um, so to communicate the advisors work to the faculty members, I realized that I had to quantify them into data that the faculty can understand. Because as a faculty member told me, we get data and numbers, and it was not data numbers. We just really don't care. Um, so I am transferring their work into a white paper and collecting data for that. So those are my three projects that I'm currently working on to really work and bring that visibility um, to the issues and the people within engineering that my first year data revealed. So with that much being said, um, that's my data. And so then the next part of my conversation is really stopping to say, how does this all tie into the APEDA community? And when I first thought about um, how I would tie this in, all in and how it would connect, I was really thinking to myself, well, do I talk about how the invisibility within the Pajita community and how my research may be working toward that. But when I had to stop and really take a hard um, look into myself about this, what I realized is that instead of that, I really have to discuss my research 
um, as it currently stands. And I have to really discuss not just my research, but my studies within STS and even working with Dr. Ha, but I have to discuss how this research repositioned me and made me reconnect um, the importance of my identity and my positionality within the APEDA community as a biracial woman of Black and Korean heritage. Because I think for so long, I really didn't consider those things. Um, and with that much being said, it's not as much as this first step isn't a, so much as about what my research is bringing to the, the APEDA community, but it's the fact that all of this research is bringing me into positionality and understanding of my own identity and intersectionality within all of these. And then that does go more into understanding how this affects my research and how I develop my research. And I say positionality um, because that has been something that has come up many times within my research as I started out. And even though sometimes I try to avoid that, I realized that I couldn't. And then also realizing that the tool of reflectivity was a tool that could help to better understand these different things. Um, and I've been using that to help guide um, myself through all these things. The very last line, research is me search, was actually said to me on my first year here by Dr. Rebecca Hester. And at the first, um, when I first heard that, I didn't completely understand it, but it always stuck with me. But as I got, as I've gotten more into my research, and even as I give this conversation, I can say it's definitely been a me search um, within all of this. So then closing up my last slide, um, the ironic thing about my research is I started developing these projects and really thinking about which podcast episodes that I was going to focus on um, in the summer of 2020. And it's ironic because that was around the same time that we had the Black Lives Matter protests really take, pick up, and sweep across not just this nation, but across this world. And then the ironic and sad part is, is that as I was working on this inclusion and diversity episode, and also as I was working hard um, for this presentation that we've had the tragedy that happened in Atlanta. And then also having just this just it, it uptick on just anti-Asian violence. And it really made me think even more about who I am as a researcher. And it's made me think a lot about what do I want to do um, as a researcher, because reading through our positionality as researchers, we do have a certain um, a level of authority and power and recognizing where my work stands and just also re recognizing and understanding who I am, how this all connects and where I wanna go. And I just think that it's just interesting that all these things happen as I have been working on this research. Um, and as I've been pushed by my advisor to also to push more into these things and um, to be more authentic within my research and within myself, which I do greatly appreciate. Um, and I guess with that much being said, that's basically the end of my um, presentation. I just want to say thank you to everybody for taking the time to listen. Here's my references. And then also just thank you so much. I take questions. Are people raising their hands and I just don't see it? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Debbie? Oh, okay. Um, uh, Annie, I really liked your talk and I really like how you delve into the transdisciplinary, um, just make, you made the transdisciplinary connections um, with electrical and, uh, and computer engineering and how um, really they can make a, um, engineers can make a social impact in a much broader way. Do you think the ECE department um, will consider any new courses that will address the breadth of career options that ECE majors can pursue outside of the traditional care, career path? That's one question. And this, sorry, I have a second question. Um, also, um, I'm just wondering what you, what your thoughts are on engineering education educators and what they can do to develop curriculum that is through a more multi-ethnic or multicultural lens and what impact that would have on the whole field. Sorry, that was quite a bit, but a lot of questions came up. There, so. That's okay. Um, thanks so much for your questions. Um, I think um, to your first question, I, I can't say. Um, I do believe that any change starts with any step. 
And I do believe that the seminar is a small step into moving to maybe something bigger that could be maybe implemented in a more concrete foundation or policy. Um, I would hope that if there is a response and need to that, that that could possibly be the case. But I do think that just starting with this one um, project is a good idea. Um, and it is, you know, going back to the research, it's supported by the research and it's speaking into what people are asking for. And it also speaks into, you know, the red grant proposal that VT um, submitted of wanting to broaden those options out. Um, and then to your second one, um, could you mind briefly? Just yeah, so I was just wondering um, what thoughts you have on, you know, how engineering educators can, um, you know, whether it's possible for them to develop curriculum um, that is that is kind of through the lens of a more multicultural, multi-ethnic lens um, instead of maybe one dominant culture, whether whether that would have an impact in the way, impact on invisibility, I don't even know if I'm articulating this no. right, would have an impact on invisibility and making people more visible, you know, or making the whole field more open to other non-traditional types of students, you know. Thank you. Um, that, that's a complicated question to ask because the one thing I've learned since being on this project is that engineering education, education by itself is quite complicated and it's complicated by so many things. I do think that if we look into studies within engineering education specifically, we can see where there are there is work to bring in um, and discussing the, the needs to maybe bring in different voices mm -hmm. and how that impacts the end product of um, engineering and design and different things like that. I think that's part of what the red grant itself is hoping and looking to do. Mm. So does that, I don't know if that helps answer. No, question. that helps. I actually think the, what you were doing and through your projects is, will probably help kind of uh, spotlight or highlight some of the areas where they can, uh, where the curriculum can um, be developed in a way that involves different cultural backgrounds or viewpoints. And that probably would have a huge impact on um, even the application of, of the skills and the knowledge that they have and how that, and that would in, have impact on really reaching a wider uh, part of society. Mm -hmm. So okay. good Thank work, you. good Thank work. You. Hi, there's just one more question. And then after that, I'd like to go on to Hannah's presentation. But in the chat, um, Annie, great presentation. How do you plan to generalize your findings beyond the Virginia Tech community or beyond electrical engineering? Okay, um, that's a great question. And thank you for it. When I first started working on this project, I this goes back into the STS knowledge. Um, one thing that I did recognize and I did learn, and one of the things my dissertation challenges is that when it when we get down to the very details of the groundwork of being a social scientist and going into these communities and developing the projects, I did not find a lot of groundwork research on there. And I, I remember just saying like, nobody told me how to do this. And so part of my dissertation is also outlining the things that I encounter when I when I am making these projects, and the ideal I had is that right now I am in this in this community that is the ECU department, but I would like the knowledge that I'm getting from developing implementing these projects to be able to be shared with other social scientists and other STS scholars to help them go into communities to um, become engaged, and so that's where I see it going beyond. Thank you, Thank Annie. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Um, Thank you. Next is Hannah. You all can see my slides? OK, cool. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about advances in automotive safety and specifically how the project I'm working on in our lab is looking at improving occupant protection for small females. Um, before I start, I just want to say thank you. I know we've said it a bunch today, but really thank you so much um, for taking the time out of your evenings. We all really appreciate it um, and for giving us this opportunity um, to celebrate 
um, our successes and our contributions um, in our community. And of course, thank you to Dr. Ha for this opportunity um, and Annie and Junwon for um, such great presentations, um, especially Annie for bringing up how intersectionality is really important in all of the fields um, that we're in. And hopefully you'll be able to see that um, in some of the work that I'm presenting. Um, so just a little bit of background. I grew up um, right on the Beltway um, outside of DC and I had a really great opportunity um, in high school to be exposed to engineering. Um, so I decided to follow LeBron to Cleveland um, in 2014, help him get a championship. Um, and while I was um, there, I spent a summer actually here at Virginia Tech working in Dr. Wong's lab, um, who's on this call and I know that uh, many of you know him. Um, but that was a really great opportunity. Um, you know, we've all been kind of reflecting on our experiences as a PETA graduate students um, doing our work. And um, that opportunity I had in college was really um, a very big stepping stone for me to see that, you know, grad school is a real opportunity and that I can do this and to have someone that looks like me and can advocate for me um, just kind of give me that boost. Um, so now I'm here at Virginia Tech. I'm a third year PhD student um, in biomedical engineering. Um, and the work I do is in automotive safety and crash injury biomechanics. So even though we've come a long way in terms of vehicle safety and occupant protection, um, there are still a lot of people dying on US roadways um, every year. Um, almost two and a half million people get injured um, due to car crashes. And what's really unfortunate is that these injuries and fatalities um, are classified as unintentional um, injuries and deaths. And if you add up all of those numbers, um, unintentional injuries actually account for more than twice um, the deaths of cancer and heart disease combined. So it's really something that impacts a lot of us. And you know, I know that we all drive and ride in vehicles, maybe not so much anymore because we're all inside. <laughs> Um, but what we're really trying to figure out um, in our lab is how can we reduce those injuries and fatalities um, because of car crashes, um, and specifically how can we make vehicles safer um, by improving occupant protection um, for all groups. Um, so I do have some videos. Uh, the sound is off, but for anybody that is going to get triggered um, or just doesn't want to watch, feel free to look away. Um, I know that, you know, some people have had some really nasty incidents um, in vehicles. Um, so normally when we're assessing vehicle safety um, and we're trying to protect occupants, um, really the go-to in industry um, is to do car crashes. Um, and every car that you buy on the market now um, has gone through testing. And so they have all these government regulations. And if you look at this slow down zoom in version, um, you can see that there's two crash test dummies inside. Um, and then it, when it impacts, you'll see um, the seat belts restrain and then the airbags go off. Um, and we refer to those as passive safety systems um, because they don't go off until the crash um, has already occurred and they're really there um, to mitigate um, or prevent further injuries and deaths. Um, so when we're assessing occupant safety, there's kind of three main modes um, in our field. Um, the first is crash test dummies, which you just saw in the previous video. Um, and there's a couple standards out there, um, but those are not the best because they're made of rubber and metal. And we all know that as people, we are not made of rubber and metal. Um, so a little bit of an improvement um, with post-mortem human surrogates or cadavers. Um, they uh, are not made of rubber and metal, they're bodies, um, but they are not alive. Um, and kind of the next push um, in our field is computational human body modeling um, because we can run a lot more simulations as opposed to gearing up for all of these tests that take weeks and weeks um, to get ready. Um, and we can run a lot of different simulations um, with safety systems, both passive and active. So watching this crash again, um, from the front, you can see that the two dummies um, in the driver and the passenger seat um, are different sizes. So the one in the driver's seat um, is, or it represents a 50th percentile male um, by height and weight. So it's supposed to represent an average male um, occupant in the United States. And then the dummy on the right um, is a fifth percentile female height and weight crash test dummy. So it's supposed to represent um, the smallest occupant. Um, but what's interesting to note is that um, for most uh, of these tests, it's really just the 50th male that gets sit in, or sat in the driver's seat um, that 
fifth female um, in the passenger seat isn't always there. Um, so it really makes you question, how are we protecting our females um, in vehicles? Um, the short answer is maybe we're not doing the best right now. Um, so males are actually the most commonly studied demographic group, specifically mid-sized males um, in automotive safety. Um, so when we're looking at vehicle safety systems, when we're looking at um, computational human body models, all of those are typically designed, tested, and um, validated with um, the mid-sized male demographic group. So then it leads us to the question of, are we really protecting females? Um, and how can we make sure to address that increased risk? Um, so females in, you know, are not just physically different in terms of size. They also have inherent structural and material differences. Big surprise, that took a long time for our field to realize we are different um, on the inside. So not just that, but also the fact that they are disproportionately understudied. It means that the current vehicle safety systems are not designed. Um, for them in mind right now. Or if they are, they're not as represented in terms of the validation data. So to throw another wrench into the loop, um, in addition to passive safety systems in recent years, we're also looking at um, active safety systems. So um, when we are doing um, vehicle testing, we position all of the crash test dummies or the um, cadaver is very nicely, um, but the issue with active safety systems now is that people are moving uh, before the um, imminent crash, um, or they're just moving around a lot more because the active safety system can put them out of position. So um, we've seen things like lane assist. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar if you have newer vehicles with lane departure warning and lane keep assist, um, as well as forward collision warning um, that gives you a signal um, if there's a car in front of you. And then what's coupled along with that, this video is actually the same because they're usually coupled together is the warning will go off and then sometimes the autonomous emergency braking system will kick in. Um, and there's also a pedestrian version of that. So the reason why this is important is because more and more active safety systems are gonna become the standard. Um, these crash avoidance technologies are really becoming more prevalent. Um, you can see even in the last couple model years. Um, so in model year 2016, actually, over half of the US vehicle series um, offered some type of frontal crash prevention system as an optional safety feature. Um, so you can see that right here. Um, and then 20 automakers, which actually um, comprise over 99% of all the automakers in the United States, have committed to making forward collision warning and autonomous emergency braking a standard safety feature. Um, Actually, that's within a year, <laughs> I've forgotten that it's 2021 now. Um, so it's really important that we understand how these active safety systems um, are affecting occupants both before and during a crash. Um, so what we're doing um, in our lab for my dissertation is trying to figure that out with some human volunteer testing. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, occupant safety is evaluated with an idealized driving position. Um, I don't know about you all, but I don't sit perfectly in my vehicle. So kind of a big question there as to why we do that, um, especially if these active safety systems are moving us around. Um, so because these systems can kick on, especially with autonomous emergency braking, um, it can displace or move you prior to your crash. And we're talking about the one or two seconds right before. Um, so to address this, some computational human body models have started to incorporate active musculature into their models. So basically, if we add in reaction time and uh, muscle activity, can we figure out how occupants are moving and then figure out how they're potentially interacting with their vehicle safety systems differently? Um, so um, like the seatbelts and airbags once the crash has potentially occurred. The problem with this is that um, a lot of these models, like I've mentioned previously, are validated with um, male data, especially mid-sized male data. Um, and that really doesn't represent um, the occupant populations that drive or in vehicles. So what we're trying to do with our volunteer study is quantify the occupant response by looking at a variety of different things for fifth percentile female and 50th percentile male volunteers. So those are by height and weight. You can see on the left, um, a fifth female is very, very tiny. Um, it's about 100 pounds and five foot, um, and then 50th male. Um, the measurements are there. So we run a variety of low speed um, sled tests. They're all very safe. Feels like riding a bumper car. It's very fun. I've done it myself. Um, and we're basically trying to figure out the differences between all of these different groups and parameters. 
um, to better understand how people are moving in response to some of these events. So each volunteer, they come in on two separate test days. Um, it's very fun. They get to hang out with us for a lot of hours, watch a lot of Netflix, and they make a lot of money um, in return. Um, so they experience four tests on one day and four tests on a different day. Um, we test them in two different orientations, both frontal and frontal oblique. And that's important to note because um, a lot of frontal crashes actually don't happen in a purely frontal mode. Um, a lot of them actually happen a little bit offset. So if you kind of imagine the edges of your windshield, where your A pillars are, um, where those blind spots are. And then we're also looking at two different acceleration pulses. So the 1G1 on the left um, is very long in terms of automotive safety world. It's um, half a second. And that simulates an autonomous um, braking event. And then the pulse on the right, the two and a half G pulse is much shorter, um, more intense. <clears throat> um, that simulates a... Um, low speed frontal crash. And then we're also looking at um, two different muscle conditions, both relax and brace. Um, so the volunteers either um, being relaxed and told to sit um, in a normal position as opposed to bracing prior to impact. Um, and that's to kind of get the whole range of muscle activity and kind of give us the two different spectrums of relax being um, if an occupant is unaware of something happening versus they are aware um, they're, they have some sort of physical reaction ahead of time. So on each day, um, they experience the tests in this um, same order. Um, each test they do, or sorry, each day they experience only one um, test orientation. And you can see that in the braced one, um, the subject looks um, different compared to relax because they're pushing um, ahead of the test start. Um, so this is one of our tests that we do. Um, I can't show a video because it would just crash the whole thing, but I have some screenshots. Um, so you can see it's a pretty low severity pulse, um, but the subject is still moving um, a considerable amount, um, especially with her head. And that's important to consider um, because, you know, small females, we already sit um, so close to the steering wheel. Um, you know, if an autonomous braking event were to occur um, and then a crash does occur, you're displaced so much closer, you could interact with the vehicle interior, the airbag could deploy in a way that it's not supposed to. So again, illustrating why these things are important to consider and to study. Um, and then this is the other test orientation. You can see that the test book has been rotated a little bit um, and this is kind of the front view. So you can see her knees, um, especially her right knee moving more into the steering column. Um, and then her head, you can see that it's moving over um, quite a good amount. Um, and that pillar right there um, is actually representative of where your seatbelt kind of um, attaches to your car. So, um, you know, if an accident were to occur, you really don't want to be hitting your head um, at that pillar. So we're, we're really trying to understand how these occupants are moving, um, not necessarily to make direct recommendations, um, but to see how these active safety systems can be moving you before a crash so that if a crash does occur, um, how your seatbelts and airbags and all that can protect you. Um, so this monster of a study that we're doing um, is to, again, quantify all of the differences in occupant response. And we do that um, by looking at subject accelerations. We look at forces and moments. We collect um, EMG. We collect um, belt loads, high-speed video. Um, we have a whole motion capture system set up. Um, it's really a lot um, of data. Basically trying to figure out um, from this initial position, um, how much are they moving? then again in the other view, um, and really to collect um, a lot of new female, especially um, in male biomechanical data, which can be used to um, both develop and validate computational human body models that have this active musculature um, to not only represent um, these different occupant populations, um, but to better predict their occupant response, um, try to figure out their injury risk, and to ultimately make sure that the safety systems we're putting in vehicles are actually going to protect them and do their job. Um, so understanding both right before the crash and then during the crash. Um, so really quickly, I just wanna go through my acknowledgements um, because like I said, this is a huge monster study that we're doing um, and I would not be able to do it by myself. Um, so Dr. Albert, Dr. Gazik and Dr. Kemper, uh, my committee members, mentors, advisors, um, they really have been 
such a great help um, in guiding me through this process. Um, this work is funded by the Global Human Body Models Consortium, which develops these human body models and so we're feeding the stages to them. Um, but they um, have been really great in um, giving us the funding um, and input that we need. Um, and then lastly, Thank you so much to all the volunteers that participated in the study. Um, it is really fun hanging out with them, um, but also we wouldn't be able to collect any of this data um, without their um, participation. And with that, I will take any questions. Hannah, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, do you factor in pregnant women and small pregnant women into the study? Great question. Um, so we are actually looking for healthy volunteers, or I guess not anymore because COVID. Um, but when we were recruiting, uh, we were looking for healthy volunteers. So what that means is someone between 18 to 25, um, because actually in Audubon of Safety, once you hit 50, you're old. Um, so we look for younger individuals um, and the females we test are actually um, not pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, I do the urine tests myself, so I can confirm that we double check every single person. Yeah. Um, I know that there are some biomechanics groups um, that look at elderly women, um, especially um, in terms of like the lower lap seatbelt. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but your uh, lower seatbelt is actually supposed to sit on your pelvis and not your tummy. Um, because if it sits on your tummy, it'll just go through all your squishy organs during a crash. So make sure it's on your hip bones. Well, I actually meant, you know, a woman who is maybe closer to term. I mean, how, how do you factor something like that in? Yeah, it's really difficult, um, especially because like pregnant women, they, they, they're different. You know, they have a bunch of different hormones. They're physically different, um, a lot of different things to consider. Um, our group doesn't really focus on that. Um, I know that a lot of other groups, we, there's definitely not any, you know, live subjects or live volunteer yeah. testing um, with yeah. that. I, I know that there's um, a few groups out there. I think there's maybe one at um, UVA that does cute or computational modeling, looking at um, pregnant women. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Gary. I have a quick question. I was thinking about the 50% male, 50% uh, white male. Are there any data on what the 50% Asian male might be? I mean, that's a, just a broad category, but so is white, I guess. Yeah, great question. Um, so I don't know of anything um, specifically in our field because it's so new, um, you know, with cars being so new and then really injury biomechanics not being a thing until like the 20th century. Um, if there are a lot of studies on race, I know that our field really came to be um, because of army testing um, and a lot of the anthropometric data that was collected. If you, you know, dig deep and read into those reports, it's mostly just from white men because they recruit from the army. Um, so not only are the, you know, percentiles by height and weight skewed because they're from the 70s and people are a little bit bigger nowadays, um, it, it's really pulling from, like you said, just white men. But definitely something to consider for the future. I know in other biomechanics areas, um, especially gait, which is a little bit related to what we do in terms of whole body, um, there are a lot of studies um, nowadays looking at race. I have a question. Um, I think related to um, this kind of topic of identity, I was wondering what is the purpose of um, gendering the two models or dummies as opposed to talking about like a small person or a large person or something like that? Yeah, so in our field, um, kind of the assumption is that if we test for the extremes um, and in the middle, that will encompass everyone. Um, so I guess the assumption there is being that females are smaller than males, but so that's why it's fifth female because that's the smallest number that you're going to get. Um, but also um, between males and females, there are inherent differences <clears throat> um, with um, tissue structure, with um, bone material properties. Um, our lab does a lot of work looking at ribs. Um, so it's not just a size difference. There are a lot of inherent differences. And even some of the volunteer work we do um, 
you know, we're seeing, well, not necessarily in our study, um, but some of the work that I've looked into, there's, you know, a different <clears throat> um, reaction times. Um, so they're, they're very different groups. Um, it, it's not just a physical size thing. I see. Um, I was wondering about that, like, you know, the different kinds of other factors. Um, at the same time, I'm wondering, like, I guess I, I'm wondering about the implications when we take into account like trans persons or something like that. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that gender is not a binary and all of those kinds of things, I think it complicates some of that. So um, it's just interesting to hear how that's being thought about um, in your field. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think because the field is so new, I don't, I don't know how far it's really gotten. Um, a lot of the researchers definitely don't look like me. So I, I wonder how much um, of that goes into their thinking when they're developing a lot of this. Hannah, just one comment. I can relate to um, sitting in the car not having a perfect fit <laughs> so anything to do to to make uh, seats more safe and comfortable for more perhaps petite uh body types would be great and so yeah it was definitely a big shock when i first joined my lab i didn't have any experience in this um but to find out that um I guess it took them a while to figure out that uh, girls also drive cars too, and we're a little bit different, so they should they should also protect us. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you all for an amazing, amazing um, presentation. Not just one, but every all of you. Um, I wanted to. Uh, see if there were any more questions in the chat or before I start actually asking a few questions for all three of you, especially. I first wanted to start with um, Zhongwen. Um, I was really interested in more of your analysis of why you chose the music video you did and to really address the gendered and racial performativity and how that affects um, people watching um, and witnessing sort of the, the racialized and gendered um, or maybe even sexualized um, performativity that, that, you, um, that was sort of being engaged in, in that um, music video. Yeah, so that's a great question, Dr. Ha. Um... So uh, I'm gonna just come uh, be frank. That's not the version that will get presented at the regional conference. So that's not really my data. And I wanted to keep it actually, and actually uh, one of my committee members really raised a good question. Um, but I attempted to engage with that to convey the meaning that I was trying to convey with, um, so actually the study is based on 15 participants who are uh, university affiliates at a Southern university. Korean American, Korean International, and white affiliates asked them about how, and so it's really analysis of that data. But with regards to the performance, well, I think there's a lot that needs to be left analyzed. I mean, is it really subversion if there are things that are coming across as, you know, docility, which is like a, one of the hallmark of uh, racialized femininity, if you will, with regards to Asian, American, Asian women uh, more broadly? Uh, and she is a, a Japanese woman. So, I mean, that's, and so there's a lot to take into context there, but I just wanted to make that clear that it, this is not the data. It was sort of the muse, if you will. I actually just found it on YouTube today. And I thought that was really interesting because I ended up seeing that video, uh, the music video of Dynamite by BTS at one of the WASU um, culture shows or culture, um, what is it, sessions, like a workshop. And it, I was kind of like, wow, this is a really good song. And then somebody covered it, it ended up being. So I think there's a lot of meaning to be dissected there. Um, uh, once again, I think that just illustrates and showcases, uh, if you will, uh, blinders and knowledge production as all of our research have illustrated. So my viewpoint going into that was probably not as, you know, I probably missed some stuff there. 
So more the reason to continue to think about those three things that you mentioned, Dr. And thank you so much for raising that question. With that being said, um, yeah. And for Annie and Hannah, um, what I I think what's sort of interesting about the presumption of 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 being in a STEM field is is that um, for some reason we don't address um, society, <laughs> race, culture, gender, ethnicity. I was thinking about. Um, and how it, like how it gets translated, right? The research that is being done, if the only type of research is just the the quote unquote average white male, um, what happens to women who are obese, right? What happens to um, you know all of these um, just just topics of diversity within the STEM and and. and I wonder how it's getting addressed, or if it's getting addressed in in your departments, in your cl the classroom space, um, in these areas where it needs to be addressed. But I'm just curious um, how it's being addressed, maybe in your your different areas, especially in STEM, um, for sure. Um, okay, um, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, thank you for asking that question. And it, it's, it's, I, I, it's interesting because I sit on both sides of it. Um, because before I came into STS, I was basically in, a, in studying within the STEM field. Um, I did like my master's in um, IT, cybersecurity, and I had a healthcare background before that. And for myself, we just, it was really never taught of looking at these things through the intersectionality of what affects them and what creates them. Um, and then I came into STS with no knowledge or background of the um, different, of just the theories. Um, but coming into it, it opened my eyes in a lot of different ways. Um, and it wasn't always comfortable, let me say that also. Um, it was challenging to have to break down everything that I knew for so long and have to say, okay, yeah, I see it now. Um, I think that within um, like the different fields, I think one, like with, if we look at ECE, if we think about what the red grant is doing, I think that as a team, we are working toward that these projects alone, I couldn't, I couldn't do it without the red grant funding. I couldn't do it without what the red grant is and what it pushed to do and also the support of that whole team. Um, and so that's, I think, part of it. But then if you look at the STS side, we have um, engineering study, I mean, engineering cultures class. And we have these different things where we're constantly looking at engineering and STEM fields to say, okay, how can we better intersect the society? I mean, it's, it's, it's right there in our name, right? Um, you know, science, technology, and society. Um, and then, you know, there's other fields that are slowly, um, I think, uh, we're picking this up. And I think because there is more movement from the humanities and the social scientists, it is putting that pressure on to say, hey, okay, these things um, are important. They do affect us. And then saying, oh, this is where, where we miss these things because maybe we did have this one image population that was basically controlling the button to a certain degree. So I think we are working on it. I think things like what we're doing right now can are pushing us continuously forward to address these things because they do have to be addressed. Yeah, Annie, I think you make a re really great point about um, slow progress. I think the word I'd use maybe is reactionary. Um, at least, you know, with with vehicle safety, it's we we kind of wait until there's a problem and then it's like, oh, we, we need to do something about it. The example I like to give is with airbags, when they first came out, they were made for men, they were made for bigger people. And then we were seeing these injuries and deaths um, and they were kind of like, oh crap, we need to maybe make some depowered airbags. So um, you'll see in vehicles now and maybe the cars you drive, um, if there's actually a, a weight sensor um, in, in the front seats and it lets the car know like, hey, if this is a smaller occupant, maybe deploy the airbag at a not so powerful um, or in a not so powerful way um, because we don't want anyone to get decapitated. Um, 
but you know, very much reactionary. And then, you know, at least with the work I do um, and my fellow grad students, we are funded a lot um, by industry sponsors or by um, the consortium that I mentioned that develops these models. Um, you know, so a lot of the work we do is guided by them, um, which is guided by um, uh, industry, so automotive companies. Um, so it's really on them um, and other stakeholders, insurance companies um, to push um, for, um, you know, advocating for these populations. And sometimes that's reactionary, sometimes that's um, public policy work. Um, but I think that's kind of the next step. Um, and, you know, we see this across a bunch of different science fields about being able to be more proactive. So, you know, just a generic example of like, how can we prevent diseases um, as opposed to always kind of playing catch up or treating them? Um, and I think with technology moving forward, you see this a lot with um, AI and machine learning and all of that, you know, being really ahead of the game and considering all of these um, intersectional factors, I think is gonna be really important moving forward. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I think one last- yes. Pardon? Are we out of time? Pardon? Oh, um, we are at 6.15, but um, go ahead, uh, Dr. Samantha. I just had a brief question. Yeah. This was for Hannah. Um, firstly, I was really interested in the reflexivity aspect that, you know, Annie broke out. Unfortunately, do one, I missed your talk because I was trying to get in. Um, but, it's okay, um, you're on my committee, so you'll read it eventually. <laughs> Okay. No, but I would have been interested. I just had a problem getting it. But Hannah, I was just curious, how do you transport your findings? Do you trans, I mean, export, excuse me, not transport, export this finding to say other parts of the world? Um, how would you, or, you know, in future, how would you be able to factor that in? Or yes. have you thought about it? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so, the consortium that we're feeding our data to, um, it's global, um, so worldwide, and all of the different, um, I guess the best word would be stakeholders that are part of that consortium are a bunch of different institutions um, around the country and around the world. Um, so other academic institutions um, being a part of that. Um, my graduate program is actually with Wake Forest University, so I work a lot um, with our mm -hmm. collaborators down there. Um, and then those, the other stakeholders that kind of feed into that are also um, automotive companies um, for around the world. Um, so way down the pipeline, you know, our hope is that we take this academic work, it goes to these stakeholders. Um, but, you know, there's also conflict because um, people in the industry, they have different um, motives um, and goals as opposed to us in industry. Um, but we definitely um, get to talk um, with a bunch of different people. I know, you know, when we're on sponsor calls, um, there's people from GM, there's people from Ford, there's people from Toyota, um, really listening to what we're doing. Um, and some of the other grad students in our lab, um, or actually, sorry, they're professors now, um, they um, have done work um, that's directly sponsored by Toyota. So th those companies are, um, you know, also interested in the um, pure research that we're doing um, as they're trying to figure um, some of these safety systems out. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to sort of have questions or to just express for me, just to express once again, just my um, appreciation for for sharing your work and for um, I wanted to recognize to once again it's it's been difficult you know and to acknowledge um, and, and to acknowledge how how difficult it is to be an APIDA person right now at this time and still be able to give a professional presentation and and to showcase your work with such, um, hopefully, like, I'm so proud of you. Um, and I hope that doesn't sound condescending. I just, you know, I, I work with all, all of you and uh, it's been just, you know, incredible to, to see and actually hear um, some of your work for the first time and, and to share it among uh, this, um, as I said, in very interdisciplinary dialogue um, that I think is really incredible too. And I think we'd need to have more of these, these conversations and these um, 
this sort of research areas where they're intersecting in these ways to really showcase how the humanities, social sciences, and sciences really work together and should be talking to one another in these um, very strategic ways. So thank you again for staying, all of you who <laughs> stayed for the entire time. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to, you know, supporting our students because they they drive me and they they inspire me every day and i learn so much from them um, so thank you you should go you know get some food now <laughs> and celebrate